Hi guys and girls, with this video I would like to open a mini series of videos on the habits in the crazy Victorian age. And I don't know about you, but I'm fascinated by the practices and the customs of the past and I find particularly interesting and strange those practiced in the Victorian era. I will start with the Victorian hygiene habits and then continue with other topics that I hope will intrigue you too. First of all, what we call the Victorian era or the Victorian age is the period of English history included in the long reign of Queen Victoria that is from 1837 to 1901. During this period, England enjoyed a period of stability, economic prosperity and commercial and colonial expansion, but also saw the rising of important social problems. The Victorian hygiene practices that I will talk to you about may disgust you, but consider that in those days, at that time, many things did not exist. Inventions such as hair dryers or running hot water were light years away and above all, many did not even have running water at home. It was a luxury granted only to a few wealthiest. In fact, only the tall buildings and high society imposing mansions had a personal well. The other people went to the village well for water and it wasn't exactly close the house. The people of the lower classes washed themselves directly into streams and rivers, but in an era where fever made killings even amongst the wealthy, you can imagine how cold were the winters and how many people would have had the crazy idea of diving in a frozen stream in December. None, of course. The hands. Washing our hands was not as common as today. We can wash our hands at home as every time we touch something on the street. If you were poor, you washed your hands at the well because when you returned home, there was no water. Amongst the richest on the table, there was a bowl with water and lemon, but as a disinfectant, it was not really a big deal. The bathroom. Washing often was highly discouraged by doctors. Emerging the whole body in the water made people more vulnerable to infections, according to them, so it was better to use a sponge and frozen water. Both men and women used to wash at least once a week, but then, of course, personal habits could slightly change. The weekly baths was just the bare minimum, and many did only just that. Additional person washing was usually requested from their servants only in these two cases. After a good ride, where they sweated a lot and got dirty with mud, grass, soil and above all the clothes smelled of horse. After a dance, where they sweated because of bulky clothes, the crowding of the room and movements during the dance, above all it was also used to relax the feet that were destroyed by what were the shoes of the time. Weekly bathing was usually done after dinner. The servants had the task of heating the water and then pouring it in a large tub where the owners emerged themselves relaxing in the warmth. The servants, once the owners had finished washing, with the water now almost cold, could take advantage of it and wash themselves. Obviously, it was forbidden to waste more water or heat it again. The poorest had only the river as a choice. To mask the bad smells emanating from the body, women perfumed themselves with oil and talc. And don't imagine today's perfumes, it was often grey amber, obtained from whale sperm or dung moss. The hair. We know that in the 70s, the elaborate wigs were full of lice and fleas. It is not strange to imagine them jumping from one head to another. Unfortunately, there were no hair dryers and the heating was that of the fireplace. The houses were not waterproofed and warm as you can think. In winter, the hair was washed very little. The risk of incurring a serious influence could be very high. Imagine these women with long wet hair swabbed with towels and then brushed in front of the fireplace until they got dry. Can you imagine how long the procedure was and if a rich woman could even afford this luxury every now and then during the winter, a poor woman could almost certainly never have. 
bronchopneumonia staying with tons of wet long hair. The men could also go to a barber. The woman instead did everything in the house with the trusted personal maid. The hair got washed in a tub or a special basin. First the soap was used and then substances were added that would help make the hair shiny. Lily of the valley, honeysuckle and rose were the usual fragrances of the oils which were added to the water in order to perfume the hair. The hair was also washed with ammonia and hot water or onion juice. Poor peasants and servants and people of the lower classes washed themselves mostly in the river. Even their hair, done in the summer drying them by the sun, raised heat. In any case, it was not as frequent as we wash them nowadays. Dental care. Unfortunately, it was not uncommon for the teeth to be rotten, yellowed, and by the age of 30, many had already a denture of gold teeth. Bad breath was not unusual at all. As for all our hygiene, we can say that oddly enough, the poor were advantaged. As a matter of fact, as they could not follow the same diet as the rich, full of sugary and fatty things, they followed a poorer diet, mostly composed of vegetables, so their teeth were less at risk than those of a high society. Another plague for the rich for the oral problems was alcohol, which the poor could not afford, whilst another point in favour of the poor class was the licorice root that the peasants chewed continuously and provided valuable support for oral hygiene. In any case, having bad teeth or bad breath was common. In fact, the toothbrush was hardly used. More attention was given to the smile after the mid-19th century and the first toothpastes were also invented. Unfortunately, they were more harmful than useful as they affected the enamel of the teeth. The mixture was made up of lemon and baking soda. Obviously, the rich and the bourgeois came to the use of the toothbrush long before the populace. Personal hygiene. You should know that in those days, touching one's own private parts was considered almost a masturbation, something dirty, disgusting, not allowed at all. This was true for both men and women. Consequently, intimate hygiene was also non-existent. Avoiding touching those parts of the body as much as possible, a sponge was quickly passed during the bath, but very slightly and without particular care in order to avoid lingering in those places that were forbidden to touch. Religious fanatism in those days was deeply felt. Chamber pots and bodily functions. The chamber pot was used both by men and women. It had a link thank goodness, and was used for both feces and urine. It was used in the morning, in the evening, and whenever you needed it during the day, if you were at home. When you were not at home, you used the so-called Vaudalou. It was a portable chamber pot designed for ladies. This object inherits its name from his inventor, Louis Bourdalou. He was a French Jesuit and skilled preacher, so skilled and talented as to say mass at the court of King Louis XIV in the chapel of Versailles. His endless sermons, however, constituted a problem for the ladies of the time, who, with all those skirts, petticoats, overskirts and various bundles, had to leave the function in a hurry to carry out bodily functions. So, as not to miss a moment of the beautiful sermon, the preacher invented the Bordalou. At first glance, it may resemble a soup tureen, but it is a portable vase designed for the woman. They were oval shaped on the sides. On one side, they had a spout to be able to empty them in a practical way and on the other, a handle to hold them. They could be used by sessions or by slightly crouching. In the 700s, they became common use for all the women who had always carried them with them and what would made more is even disturbing is that they used them everywhere almost everywhere at the balls, at the table, in church, in the carriage, once used and stored, covered by the servants, had the task of emptying them. Can you imagine what a nice job that was? 
knowing that everything was glamorous at the time, then you can imagine that there were not simple white porcelain night vases. Some were even small porcelain works of art. When the ladies went to the balls or major social events where they could not go to the bathroom because of the layers on layers of ceremonial clothes in which they were bundled up, they used the bourdalou. A poor maid placed it discreetly between the lady's thighs and when the lady had done, she removed it and took care of making it disappear very quickly. Walking during the long walks with our friends, our ladies, if they had a sudden urgent need, stopped to chat and did it standing directly on the spot, whatever it was. Once finished, very quietly, they started walking again, passing over the body waist with a long train. This was possible because the underpants of the Victorian woman were cut, cut right underneath, leaving the private parts uncovered. It was two legs of fabric joined at the waist by a string, but without the middle seam. For men, this situation was better. They could use the public toilets where, by paying, they could free themselves without literally doing it in their pants. In addition, they had the comfortable flap of the pants that offered them the opportunity to free themselves in a much more practical way than the ladies. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and let me know in a comment if you are interested in these curiosities about the past and the Victorian world. See you at the next video. Bye!